almost have to remember back to 2004 where ideas about urban transportation were so different than today. It wasn't so long ago, back when we were just starting the New York City Streets Renaissance, that there was really this default mindset that cars were inevitable, that traffic was gonna dominate the city, and that there was nothing you can do about it. There was this sense that we were stuck. You know, transportation policy was stuck in this 1950s mindset where the automobile was dominant and all the other sort of users of the street were secondary. It was not hospitable to cyclists at all. Pedestrians were an afterthought in the planning process. Cars were everywhere. And in fact, the city was promoting cars as a good sign of vitality and economic prosperity. And so a huge amount of the initial work we did was just to convey the idea that there were better solutions out there. We saw all of these really interesting ideas starting to happen in other cities at the very turn of the 21st century. And there was this sense that you know New York City had just fallen behind. One of the things that we started doing in 2005, 2006, was just going out and filming on the street and talking about both the dysfunction of the street and our vision for how those streets could be transformed. And not just doing videos, but doing photo sims so people could really get a picture of what we were talking about. So we would go to Bogota and look at bus rapid transit and Cyclovia. We would look at London's congestion pricing experiment. We would look at Paris turning its you know, riverfront expressway into a beach. When you look back at the photo sims that we did 10 years ago, so many of those places have actually been transformed and look so different today and have been radically improved. In 2005, you know, there was no Twitter, there was no Facebook, their blogs were really not a thing that you could do as a profession. What really grabbed me about Streets Blog when I was a reader was it was really special to have a place where you could go where people were questioning the status quo on the streets and saying, look, like this isn't right, that everything has been set up in a way that prioritizes motor vehicle movement. Until Streets Blog came along, no one was really questioning that in a systematic way. What I valued about Streets Blog when we were developing Plan YC was the way its detailed daily coverage not only informed me in my work in a very real way and the rest of my team in City Hall, but also served as the point that advocates and everybody who cared about this issue knew where they could make an impact, what they had to weigh in on, who they had to talk to. And I think in that sense, Streets Blog played an invaluable role. You know, Street Builders was really just a great experiment at the beginning. We really wanted to go out and document how bad the streets were, but also show people how good they could be. And right away the films got people motivated. And they used them as tools and they used them as rallying cries to say, let's make our city better. I can really think back to very specific cases where particularly Streets Blog or Street Films made the case in a way that swayed public opinion and swayed political opinion. And today, I think it's really influenced the way we talk about streets and public space. So when I got to DC, I had read Streets Blog and seen street films, but I was really happy that within like a month of me getting there, Clarence Eckerson shows up and does this great video. It really started to get, to get the message out and reset the message about what DCDOT was trying to do. I think one of the first street films I was part of was the case for protected bike lanes. It was a turning point for our work at Transportation Alternatives, but certainly for the city as the city began to take that idea seriously. And street films really legitimized the idea and put it out in the world, and cities across the U.S. paid attention to it, and the DOT commissioner at the time, and that's how the cons started paying attention to it. I knew that it was going to be a very interesting tenure at the New York City Department of Transportation when one of my very first encounters was with Clarence Eckerson, who was in one of those low bikes with his camera just so. This is a commute in uh, Denmark. You'd see this on a rush hour basis. You'd see all these bike bicyclists coming through like that. So, 
We're not there yet, but we're trying. Street films and street blog have been lobbying for this kind of change for many, many years. In fact, they actually tilled the soil that allowed the kinds of changes that we implemented to happen. I think about making the case for Sunday Streets, which is our Ciclovia in San Francisco. Uh, we weren't seeing traction on that very good idea for a while uh, until some of our elected leaders, and particularly the mayor, saw a street film about Ciclovias in Bogota, and it really, frankly, opened up his mind, um, and we were able to then effectively advocate to bring Sunday Streets to San Francisco. We really needed to decide right from the beginning how we were going to get the films out there. We held public screenings, we made DVDs, mailed them around the country, but really it was YouTube and YouTube, remember, was just in its infancy and we made the decision just let them go out and be tools for people in their communities to use to accomplish change. And then when I went to Chicago, Streets Blog understood the impact of stakeholder engagement and activism and rolling it all into one. And Streets Blog helps to externally get people motivated to make the change and celebrates the changes as you make them, which I think is super important. When the proverbial crap hit the fan, they were there to stand behind us and the changes, and they actually telegraphed to a larger audience the importance of safer streets, more sustainable streets. And without their support, I don't think we would nearly have gotten as far as we did. Street blog is really important in helping to defend livable streets uh, from what seems to be the inevitable backlash. The classic case, of course, is the Prospect Park West bike lane battle, the great bike lash of 2010 and 11. There was this, this real torrent of opinion and against what DOT was trying to do. And it was all driven by just a few people who were upset about the Prospect Park West bike lane. And they had a pretty powerful set of friends and acquaintances inside city government, inside the media. What Streets Blog did was just get the truth out because you can just show, here's the data that shows injuries are down and there's actually a, a pretty substantial grassroots movement to make this change happen. talking about MTA raids and diversion of funds, she spot elevated the issue. We were the first outlet that really explained how Albany was raiding MTA revenue. And it wasn't just a budget cut. What the state government was doing was taking money that had been set aside for transit and using it for other things. They put out headlines like, Albany didn't cut the MTA budget, they stole from it. Or, don't believe Team Cuomo spin on MTA lockbox. With headlines like that, they educate and they inform the general population. Once the information is out there, that is what people can rally around, and that is what can drive change. Today we see, with Vision Zero and these efforts to reduce pedestrian and cyclist injuries and fatalities to sort of reduce the number of car crashes, to make driving safer, this is a, a direct result of the kind of work that, that Streets Blog has been doing for a decade. Street Blog was actually very instrumental in our case uh, for Allison after the crash, especially when the, when the news started coming out. There was a lot of victim blaming and a uh, question about what happened at the situation. Uh, Street Blog was the only one that was very sympathetic to the victims. I was even felt comfortable in getting in contact with Street Blog. It's really what got us to become activists for street safety because we we know that once someone is killed or injured, um, there's a lot of victim blaming, and we understand it's the culture of driving. This next generation of city council members, they get this set of issues in a way that just you just didn't see 10 years ago. For us, it's about bringing attention to an issue that we think is extremely important, an alternative means to transportation that is also good for the environment, good for your soul, good for your heart and your body. These are crashes, not accidents, that can be prevented and that until we get to a day when Vision Zero is accomplished, our work is not done. 
I commute almost every day to work, uh, and and so being part of this community has just given me more a feel of, of kindred spirit. And so we're growing this every day, and we need to continue to grow it if we're going to see the city that, that we all want to see. This plaza is incredibly unique on many levels for people to just relax, have a, a sandwich, and that is what you will see that's happening. I ride mostly around the neighborhood on weekends and some evenings. Uh, but big picture, watching New York City move to a more sustainable way of commuting, of getting around. The truth is the more we can do to make our streets safer for cyclists, the more we're doing to make them safer for pedestrians as well. We need to continue working, redesigning danger intersections. That, uh, we create a new culture on how New Yorkers share the street. and street films are more important now than ever uh, as newspapers are cutting budgets and cutting staff. There's fewer and fewer reporters that are really able to go in depth on local stories that matter and that's what these guys do. Seeing that people have used our work to help make better public space, bike lanes, pedestrian areas, better transit, better policies for parking, not only all of that, but to see that cities want to one-up each other, that there's a friendly competition now, that's very inspiring. And we're now at the point where we can really reset and start advocating goals like building a comprehensive large-scale pedestrian network across the city and really getting the city to the point where an eight-year-old can bike without it being a dangerous endeavor. Looking at all of the parking that blights our city and saying, you know what, we're just gonna get rid of most on-street parking. These were ideas that were too far out to really articulate even a decade ago. We're taking it to the next level, and that's what the New York City Streets Renaissance 2.0 is gonna be about.